Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you a transcribed true story from the life of Theodore Roosevelt, starring Edward Arnold on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This Sunday, a true story taken from the police records of New York City. It concerns a fighting police commissioner and his battle against a system of graft, corruption, and blackmail that reeked from the Bowery to the Battery. As our star, we are proud to welcome back Mr. Edward Arnold. Oh, yes. The police commissioner's name was Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> now, here is Frank Goss. As the Christmas season approaches, one of the most enjoyable prospects is the sending of Hallmark Christmas cards to be chosen with pleasure and mailed with pride. For in Hallmark cards of any price, you find the inherent quality and craftsmanship you want in your personal greeting to your friends. And the familiar Hallmark and crown on the back of the card shows, too, that you care enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro Golden Mayer, producers of the color picture Bo Brummel, starring Stuart Granger, Elizabeth Taylor, and Peter Ustinoff. And now, with Edward Arnold as Theodore Roosevelt, Mr. Barrymore brings you the Hallmark Hall of Fame. <laughs> Official files dated Sunday, June 30th, 1895. The city of New York was in the midst of a heat wave. It was also in the midst of a wave of reform. Tammany had been turned out of office for the first time in over 20 years. The new mayor had announced that he was going to clean the streets of Manhattan physically and morally. At approximately 2.15, Outside a saloon located on the southwest corner of 30th Street and 7th Avenue, these facts combined to make it a very hot night indeed. Open in the name of the law. Don't break it down, huh? It's too hot to hurry. Oh, well, what can I do for you, officer? How about a nice cold schooner of sights? Would your name be Kelly? It would. Would you happen to be the owner of these premises, then? And if I am? I'd been thinking it was Sunday. But it can't be, since you're open for business. Being as there's a law against running a saloon on Sunday. What is this, some new kind of shakedown? I'm all paid up the precinct. In advance, check with them and tell you. Jenna Kelly's got protection from the top. <laughs> and how about that fellow at the bar, the one in the bowler hat? He an important friend of yours? Sure he is. Well, then you'll be knowing already that he's a plain clothes man. <laughs> Mr. Kelly, it's my duty to inform you that you're under arrest and that anything you say may be... all the fun. Couldn't we be moving on, Commissioner? This could be dangerous. Yes, it could be. It is dangerous. Money against two, my jingle. Those odds are always dangerous. I'd better fetch a riot squad. <laughs> Looks like we've already got one. All right, Kelly. Do you step along quietly? Or do you keep this up till you've no saloon left to come back to? All right. Take him over to the 14th Street precinct and book him. Check. Uh, come on, you walk. Uh, <coughs> Pardon me, officer. Uh, uh, if it's a nip you're after, mister, you're too late. The saloon's been closed. Yes, sir, I see. You sent your prisoner to 14th Street. 
30 seconds closer, isn't it? Only way to get a prisoner booked for violating the saloon laws is to take him away from his home district. Then, like as not, the charge will stick. Well, sounds like a lot of trouble for nothing. It is that. But we've a new broom at Mulberry Street, president of the police commission or some such thing. And the orders come out, enforce the law without fear or favor. Mm -hmm. And you don't approve? Uh, after more than 20 years on the force, I have a bit of experience with new brooms. They wear down fast. Say, wait a minute. You'd not be one of these newspaper men, would you know? <laughs> Don't worry. I'm in an entirely different line of work. Oh? And what's that, may I ask? Well, in a matter of speaking, I specialize in brooms. New brooms. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, practically every paper in New York. Just take a look at them. Editorials, letters to the editor, cartoons. Mm -hmm. here. How about this one? Mm -hmm. Picture of two thugs carrying out a safe while Police Commissioner Roosevelt leans on the bar twirling his nightstick. Wait, wait, here. Here's another one. He's a little boy playing with a hobby horse marked Sunday Blue Laws while Father Knickerbocker watches. Well, maybe Commissioner Roosevelt is pushing this thing a little too far, Senator. A little. He's even canceled the annual police parade. Well... Claims the department isn't fit to show itself. And the next thing we know, he'll be setting up ducking stools in Central Park. You wanted to see me, Mayor Strong? Oh, yes, Commissioner. Uh, you know Senator Sullivan, don't you? Oh, yes. The Senator and I served in the Assembly together. Nice to see you looking so well, Commissioner. Thank you. Thought you'd be pretty worn down prowling the streets at all hours. Mm. Good day, gentlemen. <laughs> I, I guess you know what that was about. <laughs> yes, we must be hitting pretty close to the solar plexus when the reflexes run all the way up to the state senate. Oh, I suppose so. All the same, the Sunday closing ordinance has been on the books for nearly 50 years. It's an old-fashioned, uh, well, a blue law. Ah, the statutes were revised in 1892. How blue can a law get in three years? Look, Mr. Mayor, I'm not saying that it's a good law, but I approve of it. That's out of my department. But it is the law, and my job is to have it enforced. The system has been in effect a long time, Commissioner. Bucking it is not going to be easy. What system? Bribery, blackmail, appointments, bought and sold, $300 to be a patrolman, $1,000 for a promotion, the cop on the beach swinging a nightstick with one hand and shoving the other under the table for protection money? Well, I'm not planning to buck the system, Mr. Mayor. I'm planning to bust it. The trouble is, Commissioner Roosevelt, I didn't figure there'd be an all-out fight on this thing. I'm not sure it's the right issue. I'm not sure it's big enough. Big? Why, the Lord Harry, it's gigantic! You've read the Lexar Committee report? Half the crime in Manhattan is financed by the profits from illegal saloon operation. Well, all right, Commissioner, you've sold me. I'll back you to the best of my ability against <laughs> all comers. Good, good bully. You think you might start by taking on the chief of police? The chief of police? Uh, ever, ever hear of a football team winning any games with two quarterbacks? Calling different signals? You want me to request Chief Burns' resignation? As far as I'm concerned, you can demand it. Well, I suppose he fights us. Goes over my head, demands a hearing, appeals to Albany. The mayor can appoint a police chief, but the governor has to approve his dismissal. One of us is going to have to clear out of Mulberry Street, Mr. Mayor. And I've moved in to stay. All right. You're running the team, Commissioner. But heaven help us if we're ever hit by a Sunday crime wave. I don't anticipate one. Oh? Oh, a few more Sundays like the last one, and half the crooks in New York will be flat on their backs. <laughs> Dying of thirst. <laughs> <laughs> McCullough. What's up, Captain? I'm just wondering if you'd finish checking over that promotion list, Commissioner. Yes, yeah, just done. Let's see where I put the blessed thing. Oh, here it is. You can't tell me that there aren't fine men on this force, not after reading this list. Michael Francis Dunn, patrolman. He's the one who nabbed Kelly, isn't he? That's the man, sir. 22 years on the force. Fished 25 people out of the East River and half a dozen more from burning buildings. <laughs> Even got medals from Congress. And still a patrolman. Because he didn't know the right people. Well, he's a sergeant now. Bully. Say, uh, Commissioner, there's one name I've been meaning to mention. Patrolman Sullivan. Jerry D. Sullivan. Mm, what about him? He's Senator Sullivan's nephew. 
Well, he deserves the promotion, doesn't he? Yes, sir. But after Senator Sullivan's activities concerning Chief Burns' resignation, uh, well, I thought you might not want oh, to... Oh, wait a minute. About Jingo Captain, while I'm head of the police commission, nobody's going to use personal influence to get or block promotions. Nobody. Including me. As a matter of fact, I told Mayor Strong young Sullivan was being promoted the night before last. Got time for a visitor, Commissioner? Sure, Senator Sullivan. Always glad to welcome the men who write all these laws. Uh, I uh, heard about Jerry. It's, uh, well, it's downright noble. Figured the least I could do was say thanks. Oh, well, none needed. He's done his duty, promoting him's mine. All the same. Well, I'm glad you aren't holding a grudge about the Chief Byrne business, I mean. Grudges weigh in pretty heavy, Senator. I like to travel light. Good, good. I'm still dead set against you, Commissioner. Even so. As a citizen, you'll find efficiency improved with a new man in the chief of police's office. Well, are you planning on two of them? Hmm? The mayor hasn't told you yet? Tell me what? The governor turned down Chief Burns' resignation, ordered him back to full duty status, effective immediately. The way it looks from here, Commissioner Roosevelt, if there's going to be a vacant office at Mulberry Street, it'll be yours. <laughs> moment, we'll bring you the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. I was talking to a friend last night who said that one of the most delightful experiences of the whole year is choosing her Hallmark Christmas cards, and I know just what she meant, for she makes her choice early, about now. At this time, you can browse comfortably through the Hallmark Christmas albums of new designs, and looking through those albums puts you in the holiday mood, for here is all the color and sparkle and joy of Christmas. There are Hallmark Christmas cards as merry as Santa himself. Others have the still beauty of that first Christmas Eve. When you've selected the Hallmark Christmas card that looks as though it had been designed especially for you, you can order it imprinted with your name. Within a few weeks, your cards will be delivered to be addressed at your leisure. So give yourself a treat this week. Select the Hallmark Christmas card to be imprinted with your name. And on the back, of course, will be the familiar Hallmark and Crown that says... You care enough to send the very best. And now, with Edward Arnold as our star, Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story from the life of Theodore Roosevelt. Summer of 1895, the opposition managed to call Police Commissioner Roosevelt just about every name in the book, except one, Quitter. The vacancy sign didn't go up on the office in Mulberry Street, and the fight was on. Theodore Roosevelt versus the system. Winner take all. New York hadn't seen a scrap like this since Boss Tweed went up the river. Unfortunately, however, there were four members on the board of police commissioners. It uh, may be, Mr. Roosevelt, that you find this hobby horse campaign amusing, but I, for one, suggest that it's high time that this commission and the New York Police Department get down to serious work. I might add that Colonel Grant is in full agreement with me. Indeed, I am, sir. I see. And since Commissioner Andrews is not present, I believe we represent a majority. This absurd anti-saloon campaign is finished. Don't be hasty, Mr. Parker. It just so happens that Commissioner Andrews, before leaving the city, provided for this eventuality. I hold here his proxy. May I see that, please? Certainly. Two against two. We seem to have reached a deadlock. Well, out in the Dakotas, they have two ways of settling cases like this. Six shooters or uh, a silver dollar. Oh, Captain McCullough, I suggest you do the honors. Heads, the campaign is abandoned. Tails, the law continues to be enforced. Agreed, gentlemen? With all the juvenile All right, you must play heard. games, Mr. Roosevelt. Proceed, Captain. Yes, sir. Here goes. 
Mm, tails. Well, the law will be enforced. The meeting will stand adjourned. Good day, gentlemen. Uh, good day. Good day. Mr. Roosevelt, hmm? this silver dollar. Oh, yes, yes. You mind giving it back? I've carried it for years. Got it out west. It's sort of a lucky piece. Oh, sure, Commissioner. But the uh, thing is, uh, when you handed it to me, it uh, looked like both sides were tails. <laughs> that Captain McCullough is what makes it a lucky piece. <laughs> Well, looks like a quiet Sunday. It's about time, too. Yeah, too quiet. Hardly seems possible we're in the bar, eh? Uh-huh. Like I said, too quiet. Hey, there. Hey, lend a hand, will you? Huh? Oh, what seems to be the trouble, Sergeant? Oh, Commissioner. I'm not glad it's you. I was afraid it was someone hunting down young Burke. Uh, you remember Burke, sir, the one who was beside me in Kelly's place. You think I'd forget a right cross like that? What's happened to him? Well, I've got him laid out in the vestibule, over here. Seems he was after trying to close up King Callahan's saloon, single-handed. Callahan's? Why, that's the biggest place in the Bowery. And the toughest. In here, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's not too bad. He's out, but all in one piece. Uh, Teddy, let's get, let's get him in the carriage. Lift easy now. Yeah, easy. Easy. Let him pick up. Yeah. Why would he try a fool thing like that? He should have called a squad. Well, I'd not like to sound the politician, Commissioner. But seems he figured if you could handle the kind of art you've got at Mulberry Street, he could handle Callahan. And did. Put the King of the Bowery into the Black Mariah, special delivery, started back to his beat, and fell on his face. Steady, lad, steady. Oh, it's the truth I'm saying, Commissioner. You'll not be winning any popularity contest among the politicians. But to the rank and file, well, at last a man has come to Mulberry Street. finest, and they are. Won't be found in the sacred precincts of Mulberry Street, but pounding the beats along the East River, and uh, uh, have you got that, McCullough? Yes, sir. I'm sorry to break in, sir, but you're the only chance he's got. I ran the whole way. Now, steady, Sergeant. Uh, get your breath. It's young Burke again, sir. He's in trouble. Bad trouble. Callahan? The same. Mm. Burke came into court this morning, bandages and all, to give testimony, and found the shoe was on the other foot. Callahan's preferred charges against him. Against a police officer? Oh, they have a proper railroad, all ready to run. Senator Sullivan, Chief Burns, even a Tammany judge. Mm, sounds like quite a party. They forgot to send me an invitation. But my etiquette's a little rusty anyway. Uh, finish the speech up, will you, Captain? Uh, you know what I want to say. Uh, yes, sir, but you can't. Not to the women's club. Uh, let's go, Sergeant, will you? Uh, what's he charged with? Come Conduct on becoming an officer, assault and battery, breaking and entering, and a few more I didn't wait to hear. Oh, they can't get away with it. They can't make them stick, can they, Commissioner? Maybe they can, Sergeant, but by the Lord Harry, they're not going to. Your Honor, if this uniformed thug who calls himself a policeman is allowed to walk free from this courtroom, the day is not far off when no honest citizen will be safe in his bed. Tell me, Burke, how, how does it look? Well, Commissioner, it looks like about 90 days free room and board, and then I hunt me a new job. Uh, are you represented by counsel? No. Mm -hmm. You are now. Oh, it's not worth it, Commissioner. They'll crucify you. Don't stick your chin out for me. Uh, the way I see it, it's the other way around. They figure convicting you will finish me. Uh, they could be right. Political ambition and to harass and brutalize the people of this city. Order in the court. Order. Your Honor, my name is Roosevelt. If the court please, I have been retained as counsel for the defendant. I object. The commissioner isn't even a member of the bar. This would be highly irregular. It would seem, Senator, that these proceedings are already highly irregular. Overruled. Mr. Roosevelt, you may act as counsel for the defendant. Thank you, Your Honor. 
I wish to move at this time for the dismissal of all charges against Patrolman Burke. Objection. The senator has spoken about police brutality. I agree that where it exists, it is a reprehensible thing. He seems to forget, however, that there are two kinds. The occasional abuse of power by a misfit patrolman subject to discipline, and the systematic abuse of the public confidence by highly placed unscrupulous officials who deliberately seek to destroy not only the morale of the entire force, but also the security and even the freedom of the public. Your Honor, this is completely immaterial. This case concerns Patrolman Burke Not and Senator only Patrolman Burke. That Senator is patently untrue. These malicious charges have been brought in an attempt to discredit the police commission and its efforts to enforce the law in this city. If they are permitted to stand, this court will place in the hands of every lawbreaker in New York a weapon more dangerous than the repeating pistol or the sort of shotgun. They strike not just at the policies of this administration, nor at the saloon closing law, but at the law itself, at the American system of equal justice for all under a government of laws and not of men. If you railroad patrolman Burke, the senator won't have to worry about my department anymore. There won't be any police forces in New York City worth the name, nor courts, nor laws, nor freedom. I object. This courtroom is no proper place for the exercise of political demagoguery. Is it, Your Honor, the proper place for the exercise of political trickery or political pressure? <laughs> Gentlemen, you will both contain yourselves. Commissioner Roosevelt, have you anything to add in support of your motion? No, Your Honor. I submit the fate of my client and of the city of New York into the hands of the court. Yeah. Court will stand in recess while we consider the motion. <laughs> well, that was some speech, sir. Thank you, Burke, but remember, Judge Thompson's a Tammany appointee. He's not likely to rule against them. Well, sir, thank you anyway for putting up such a good fight. You're welcome. The court is now prepared to rule on the motion for dismissal. Hey, Your Honor. Yes, Senator. I merely wish to express my confidence that the court has taken into consideration all the aspects of this case and its implication. You may be assured, Senator Sullivan, that the court has done exactly that. Now, perhaps the circumstances of this case, perhaps even the selection of the presiding judge have caused the defendant to feel that he would not find full justice in this courtroom. Uh, perhaps it is not intended by the prosecution that he should. However, the law is bigger than any man, any job, any party. The court finds the evidence presented does not indicate that Patrolman Burke exceeded his authority in attempting to enforce the law. All charges are hereby dismissed. Well, Commissioner, You've won this round, but I assure you, this trial is not the end. Perhaps not, Senator, but it's a very good start. trial of patrolman Edward Burke was a start, the beginning of the end for the forces fighting Commissioner Theodore Roosevelt's attempts to clean up New York City's police force. The end itself came only a few weeks later, the resignation of Chief of Police Burns, and subsequently the adoption by a unanimous vote of resolution calling for the voluntary Sunday closing of every saloon in New York. With a fighting police commissioner, however, it was the beginning of the beginning. For Teddy Roosevelt, Mulberry Street turned out to be a direct route to the White House. <laughs> now, here's Frank Goss. Mr. Barrymore and Mr. Arnold will return in just a moment. In next week's issue of Coronet Magazine, there's a very interesting article entitled... Christmas starts on a Sunday in November this year. It explains that this year, in a rebirth of religious spirit, Americans will observe more fully than ever the Holy Advent season, the days before Christmas. 
Now, there are many old world customs of observing the Advent season, but the best love tradition is the sending of Advent cards in November. And this year, the article announces, Hallmark cards are bringing this cherished custom to America for the first time. Actually, each Hallmark Advent card is 24 cards in one. For these Advent cards contain 24 little flaps to be lifted up one a day from December 1st until Christmas Eve. Each little lift up reveals a new scene or verse. Some reveal day by day the story of the Savior's birth. Others show pictures of Merry Christmas customs. These Hallmark Advent cards cost just 50 cents or a dollar. You'll want them for youngsters, for Sunday school classes and families. But remember, Hallmark Advent cards are mailed in November. So be sure to look now for these beautiful new Hallmark Advent cards at the fine stores where Hallmark cards are featured. And now, here is Lionel Barrymore with Edward Arnold. Eddie, it's good to have you back with us on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Well, you know, Lionel, during the course of my Mr. President uh, radio series, I portrayed every president in the United States history. But my favorite role has always been Theodore Roosevelt. And say, you've been doing some pretty exciting things since I was last a guest on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, both with your stories and with your cards. I think those Hallmark Advent uh, cards sound very interesting. I'm anxious to see them. And I've already seen your painting in the Christmas card album. It looks good to me. Oh, now, I'm just an amateur artist, you know. Oh, now, at any rate, Lionel, I'm sure it'll give many people a lot of pleasure this Christmas to be able to choose a card with a painting done by Lionel Barrymore. Uh, Tell me, what are you planning for next week's Hallmark Hall of Fame? Well, next week we present a true story from the life of Newt Rockney, Notre Dame's famous football coach. And here to tell the story will be another great coach of Notre Dame, Frank Lee. Mm, that sounds great. Now I'll be listening. Good night. Good night, Eddie. Good night. And until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer director is William Frude. Our transcribed script by Robert Yale Libet. Featured in our cast were Byron Kane, Jack Edwards, John Daner, Jack Crucian, Ted DeCorsia, Lou Merrill, and Will Wright. Next week, the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television will bring you a tender and moving story of Mrs. Edward McDowell, titled The Lady in the Wings. This is Frank Goss, saying goodnight to you until next week at the same time when you'll hear a true story from the life of Newt Rockney, narrated by Frank Leahy, on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. In every country, there will always be the handicapped, the old, the infirm, the children who need protection, guidance, and care. There will always be the need of a strong arm to help. We in America prefer to extend that strong arm voluntarily in the spirit of friendship as befits a free people. And that's what you are doing when you make your contribution to your local community fund campaign. You are extending the strong arm of friendship to your fellow man and proving once again that the American way is a good way for a man to live. Give generously and give enough. This is the CBS Radio Network.